Good morning, my friends. I'm Pastor Stephen Brooks. Welcome to Morning Glory, our midweek Bible study. I'm so glad that you're here today. We're going to talk about insights that will enable you to supernaturally shift to new levels, not necessarily the next level up, because there are some times in which God will actually cause you to skip the next level and go to an even higher level up. Praise God. So I want to talk about some of these insights that will help you to make that supernatural jump. Get ready today. Praise God. And by the way, we're still doing some tech upgrades over an hour, uh, normal morning glory studio. Those should be completed pretty soon. Praise God. Now, Let's begin in prayer. Heavenly Father, as we jump into your word today, we thank you for the anointing of your Holy Spirit. We thank you that he's working right now to help us do what you've called us to do and to make in many situations what needs to be a necessary jump forward. Let there even be a quantum jump forward. I thank you for that word. I like that. Thank you, O oh God. Quantum let there be a quantum leap. And we thank you that as we discuss how it can be done today, we thank you for your Holy Spirit just releasing the know-how of how to get into it. Now, Father, we praise you in Jesus' name. Around the world, we say amen. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3. Let's look at a scripture that offers us insight into this. And let me begin by saying, first of all, that faith Here's one of the first insights. Faith sees the invisible and brings it into manifestation. So there, again, there's the element of seeing that's involved. We see it in verse 3. By faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the Word of God, so that the things which are seen, that's very important, the things which are seen, everything you see today, the mountains, and the oceans, the animals, etc., the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. Wow. So you can say accurately that what you see was made or pulled from a realm that is invisible. So faith, therefore, sees the invisible and brings it into manifestation. I think this is fascinating because creation was made from things that are not physically viewable. God saw what was invisible to make what is now visible. So faith sees the invisible and brings it to pass. Now we see this also Hebrews chapter 11. Let's drop all the way down to verse 27. By faith, referring to Moses, he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. He endured as seeing him who is invisible. Well, we have to ask the question in, uh, that that would logically bring up, how do you see the invisible? You see it. Through the spirit of faith. Praise God. Now we're talking today about these insights to make these quantum leaps forward into new levels, to supernaturally shift to new levels. Praise God. And it's going to require the spirit of faith. You use your faith to see what your physical eyes cannot see. So this is what we need to do. We need to see it not for the way that it is. We need to see it for the way that we want it to be. Woo, praise God. Now, that pertains, of course, to your life and how you are to walk out your life and build your world just the way God built his and the sphere of life that you have within God's world. You can build it out the way that you want, but you have to see it not for the way it is, but you have to see by faith the way that you want it to be. Praise God. That's very important. Now, the second insight 
that I want to cover today is that faith thinks the unthinkable. Mm. It actually thinks what some would say, oh, that's not even a possibility. Well, let's go back and look at a statement about the life of Abraham, the father of faith. He understood faith really, really well. He did some amazing things. You could even say some unthinkable things. Let's see what triggered that off in his life by going to Romans chapter 4, Romans 4, and verse 19. And it says, concerning Abraham, and not being weak in faith, he did not consider. I want you to underline that. We'll come right back to it. He did not consider his own body. Already dead since he was about 100 years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. Now, look carefully where it says, and not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body. Now, the word consider, that word unveils that there is a mental consideration going on. So faith, therefore, thinks the unthinkable. He did not consider. He did not consider. In other words, he didn't get into this thing where, hey, you know, logically, this is not making any sense. I'm really believing God for something that's not logical. No, he did not get over into this realm where you tried to think out a promise. Woo! Hallelujah. So faith enables you to think the unthinkable. Well, Pastor Stephen, some people can't go there. Oh, you're exactly right on that. You better believe that because there are, there are realms with God. You begin the walk with the Lord, particularly when you get into genuine faith and you realize faith is not in the head. And there are a lot of things that will directly assault the intellectual, uh, mental ability of a man or woman to consider and work it out with your mind. But with your mind, it can't be worked out. When you have a couple that are as old as Abraham and Sarah, it's an impossibility. But when God gives you a word on something, which is what he did to Abraham, then it gives you the ability to think what previously would be unthinkable. Praise God. So he did not consider. He did not start thinking and realize, hey, this is something that's, uh, this is not even possible. No. He, he was able to recognize it. We're not denying facts. We're not denying the, the condition of the body or whatever that circumstance might be. But he didn't allow himself to get over into that. Why? Again, faith is not of the head. Faith is. My friends, as so many of you know, it's of the heart. Praise God. So let's always keep that in mind because natural conditions and all of these negative, we could call them uh, uh, negative opposing type circumstances, they have no meaning to the mental faculty of a man or woman who is operating under the spirit of faith. Woo, praise God. Mm -mm. Well, somebody might say, well, I don't understand that. Well, look, you may not understand it, but there's Isaac. So what are you going to do about that? Uh, I don't know. So that, that, that's what I'm trying to say. A lot of people would say, hey, this is, you know, this is never going to work, or this is not logical, or this or that. And Abraham, I'm trying to tell you, he went through all of that. And so the end result speaks for itself. Remember, Jesus said that wisdom is justified by its children. So this is the wisdom of God. God's word is his wisdom. And when you're working with real faith and real biblical principles that govern the law of faith, then there will be some that can't get it because they're just not dealing with their heart. All they can do is live by the five physical senses that governs uh, that governs even that it governs those in the world. And it even governs many Christians. And then you have some 
that do develop themselves in the area of their minds and so forth. And that's a vast realm that, you know, honestly can just be developed for the rest of your life because, you know, brain cells can be renewed and you're, you're always learning and there's always something new to learn. But the spirit realm is going to be a connection that's made with your heart, with the heart of man, because you are a spirit and you have a soul. Your soul is your mind, your intellect, etc. And of course you live in, in, in your body, but it's the spirit of a man, the heart of man that begins to move into this faith walk. And that will take you further than what the intellect can ever do. It can take you beyond even what is unthinkable to the natural mind. Woo. Praise God. So that's something that we need to realize with Abraham. He did not consider his own body. He didn't sit down and take a piece of paper and write out all the reasons this can't happen. <laughs> Cause he said, yes, plenty of them. He didn't do that. He didn't do that. So uh, faith is actually able to think the unthinkable. In other words, he's thinking, I'm going to have a child. Why? God told me that. Mm. And he already has the name of the child. Well, Pastor Stephen, I don't understand it. See, that's the way some people are. But look, again, there's Isaac. It actually happened. And these types of miracles are still happening today through valid expressions of true biblical faith. And this is what can cause you to jump from places of barrenness to places of a dry season into explosive growth and blessing. Praise God is understanding these various insights. Number three, the third insight is that faith expects the unexpectable mm. when others are very pessimistic. <laughs> we could say doubt and unbelief. Sure. But a lot of people like to cloak that. And even, uh, even some people in church, when you begin to pick up, uh, religious ease, you know, uh, you learn the language or the culture of the church and you can kind of talk it even if you don't really live it. And so some people can, they can disguise their raw doubt and complete unbelief by cloaking it with religious terminology. But my friends, uh, you know what? That didn't fly even in ancient Israel. In ancient Israel, you didn't get a miracle just because you're Jewish and you didn't get a miracle just because you were a natural descendant of Abraham. You got a miracle because you believed and trusted God. Mm -mm. And so faith expects what would naturally be even something that you would think, Oh uh, no, why even get our hopes up? Because it's impossible. But faith which again, when I say faith, I'm not talking about a random belief in something random. I'm talking about believing what God said in his word. Absolutely. Plus the present word that God would be speaking to you and what he's unveiled to you about your life plan. Praise God. So faith expects the unexpectable. A great example of this would be second Kings, second uh, Kings chapter seven. And let's go to verse one. Then Elisha said, hear the word of the Lord, not something that he cooked up to try to, you know, just make people feel better and, and get through a tough time. No, he is actually repeating what God has told him. And he's going to declare it right now. Hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord tomorrow about this time, a say of fine flour shall be sold for a shekel and two sayas of barley for a shekel at the gate of Samaria. In other words, you have a severe famine and hunger shortage going on. And he's saying tomorrow, right around this time, there's going to be plenty for everybody and it's going to be cheap and easy. You know, that's like saying uh, that that'd be like the equivalent of, of give it, getting a word from God and saying uh, this time tomorrow, gas will be 80 cents a gallon. <laughs> and uh, you know, you're going to have people that would laugh at that. But if the person said it had a sterling track record of being right, Oh man, you'd better, you'd better be parked at the gas station tomorrow to fill up real cheap. 
Hallelujah. Bring all your extra gas cans. Hallelujah. Praise God. Now, verse 2. And by the way, uh, verse 2, you'll always have people like this in the crowd. Maybe, maybe you even know some of them. So an officer on whose hand the king leaned answered the man of God and said, by the way, don't you wish you'd have just shut up, kept his mouth quiet? I mean, all he's got to do is wait 24 hours. If it doesn't happen, then he could, uh, then he could really release all of his stuff. But no, uh, you've always got a few of these in the crowd that will have, they just, they can't hold themselves back. They're so in the flesh that they're going to have to say it out loud and, you know, kind of, uh, put themselves on the record as being amongst that group that just has no true expectancy for God ever to move or do something good. So, uh, he said, look, if the Lord would make windows in heaven, could this thing be, I mean, he just, just like basically said, look, I don't believe it. There's just no way this is going to happen. <laughs> and the, and he, the prophet said, in fact, you shall see it with your eyes, but you shall not eat of it. Don't think that Elisha was smiling when he made that statement. He already knows he's not going to say I think what he knows, there's a lot more to it. He basically knows about this time tomorrow. Also, you're going to be dead. Wow. But he's not going to say that. It'll just, that part will walk itself out. Mm -mm. So my friends, the King's executive assistant, he had, let's just call it what it is. He had absolutely no faith. So also that he could not expect the unexpectable, even when he was told such a great promise by the great prophet of God, Elisha. So I really do believe that we need to expect the unexpectable. We need to expect God to break out and move. We need to expect abundance even during times of famine. And you need to expect a breakthrough. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Seems like there's been a real shortage Lately of, uh, you know, the baby food and the uh, baby powder and all of that stuff. And we know what the government did in a very uh, uh, corrupt understanding of knowing what they were doing when they sent it all in the wrong direction. And uh, they have no care really for their own people. They're just trying to do things that they think that their radical base will support. But my friends, uh, if, if you really need it, you need to expect that God can get, get it to you or that you can find a source because uh, God can meet every single need. Praise the Lord. Whether it's gasoline, whether it's baby formula, uh, whether it's food, whether you need a job. But my friends, have an expectancy. Have an expectancy. And again, this is how you explode to very unusual levels. Look, there's something about real faith that causes for there to be strange experiences in your life that others look at and say, I don't, I don't understand how that person's doing that. Praise God. Amen. There, there are kingdom mysteries within the kingdom of God. There are mysteries. And since faith is one of the vital core truths of the kingdom of God, it's one of the most mysterious and it can cause some of the strangest manifestations that puzzle people as they see you empowered and blessed and doing well when, when it would seem like this is a time where that can't happen. And God takes delight in difficult times of validating his word to those that are willing to even expect the unexpectable. In other words, somebody might say, well, the timing sure seems like it wouldn't be now. And God's like, oh, I can do it right now on purpose to show that I can move at any time, day or night, and in any place. Praise God. Now, the fourth insight to supernaturally shifting to new levels is that faith conquers the unconquerable. Oh, Pastor Stephen, we don't have a chance. Too many of them were outnumbered. Well, we've seen that before in the Bible. And we know that when people turn to the Lord and put their trust in him, God again takes delight in that. And he responds in very, very 
uh, unusual ways. I think one of the greatest examples would be Gideon and his army of 300 men. Praise God. Now, what happened with Gideon is that he started off with 32,000 soldiers. But God said, you've got too many because if I work with you and this army that you've pulled together, then what's going to happen is that they're going to be tempted to take the glory for themselves. And God said, I'm going to get all the glory out of this one. So reduce them down. And he kept reducing, kept reducing Gideon, kept working with this army until he had gotten it down the 300. And God said, I'm going to, I'm going to deliver Israel with the 300. Now, Keep in mind, they are up against an army that has 135,000 trained soldiers, and Gideon has only 300 men. That is a ratio of 450 to 1. You know, it'd be like being on the football team, and you have 12 uh, or, you know, 11 guys against one and you're like, hey, how can I how can I defeat the whole team? Well, imagine when you've got 300 and you tell your guys now each one of you you're responsible for 450. <laughs> so uh, go out and kill 450 and you've done your you've done your fair job. And if you're still uh, swinging and doing good, come over and help your buddy. That's what the ratio was: 300 against 135,000. Praise God. But but Gideon is a man that believes God. He trusts God and God has spoken to him and he goes in the battle and they win the tremendous battle. That's why we have verses like this. Let's go back to Hebrews chapter 11 just for a moment. We have verses such as verse 33, which gives a flashback to Gideon's victory. Verse 33, it says, who through faith, who through faith, subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Wow. Praise God. Amen. What a great victory. So faith conquers the unconquerable. When it's you and God, and you're totally leaning on him, and he's with you, it's undefeatable. It's the undefeatable team. Praise the Lord. So faith conquers the unconquerable. And that certainly can take you to a new level. And it did for Gideon, who before that, in a lot of ways, he was an outcast and couldn't fit, uh, fit in. But I tell you what, when he started swinging that sword, Everybody suddenly is like, hey, uh, hey, uh, we, uh, we actually like you. We didn't mean all the mean things we said about you. Didn't mean to really ignore you so much. Wow, you're really good with that sword. He's like, yep, I sure am. And God's with me and this sword. And then when he took out the Midianites, whoo, mm -mm, suddenly, you know, it's like, it's, it's like he, uh, well, he became the judge of Israel. Wow, praise God. He went to a very high level. Thank you, Jesus. Now, Number six, faith achieves the unachievable, the unachievable. Wow. And this, this is a realm where the Holy Spirit wants to break many of you that are watching. He wants to break you into it, into a realm that you have been told you could never achieve in that. You don't belong in that realm. You were not made for that realm. But let me tell you something. God cannot only take you towards it. He can take you into it and cause you to stand in it and to achieve even what others would say would be unachievable. How can you do it? You can do it through faith. And one of the great stories here is that of Ezra. So let's go just for a moment to Ezra chapter three, because he accomplished something that was fought tooth and nail by the devil. Now, Ezra chapter three, Verse 11, and they sang responsibly, praising and giving thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever toward Israel. That all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord, because, when, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. So 
Originally, you had the tabernacle of Moses. The tabernacle eventually transitions into a temple structure that was built by Solomon. But as we know, that temple was destroyed. Later, though, here in this time, they are rebuilding the what is called the second temple. And they have now got the foundation of the temple laid. Uh, it's good to understand that it took them two years to get the foundation cleaned off and leveled off because everything was ruins and rubbles. You got to, you got to haul the, uh, the rubble away and all the stones that have fallen down from the Babylonian destruction. You got to, you have to haul all of that off and get the uh, foundation back in order and get it all rebuilt and so forth. So they've done that. It took them two years to do that. Zerubbabel was the leader, uh, that God selected for that. And, um, he was actually the uh, head of the tribe of Judah and he was the governor over Jerusalem. And so it took two years to get that foundation laid. But then, my friends, they had a 17-year long delay. You had a lot of the Samaritans stir up a lot of trouble. And they came in language of the sky, saying, we'd like to hook up with you and help you. And, uh, but they were up to no good. And all they wanted to do was frustrate the program. And so they actually brought the building uh, progress to a complete halt. And the whole thing just stopped for 17 years. They got the foundation laid. It took two years to do that. But then there was so much persecution and the enemy just trying to bog them down with what we would call modern day red tape. Uh, you know, they're sending bad reports back to the king and the king's like, oh, is this stuff true? And uh, all of these lies and uh, and then all of the threats and the things being done to try to undermine the work of God. But thank God that the Lord raised up the prophets Haggai and Zechariah. They came on the scene. They begin to prophesy to the people of God, rebuild this house of God. And they begin to light a fire back into the hearts of God's people. And after a 17 year delay, they re-engaged in the work and they finished the entire rebuilding of the temple. It took them four years to complete it. Now, my friends, it's very important to understand that faith achieves the unachievable. And there were many adversaries that said, you will never ever rebuild that temple. And not only were there words of threats and not only was there negative uh, verbiage such as it's not going to happen. There were physical attempts made to stop it on all fronts, but you know what? Because God was in it and Ezra and all of those people, Nehemiah, Zerubbabel, Haggai, Zechariah, they're all pulling together using their faith. They got the temple rebuilt. And we see a beautiful example here in chapter six, Ezra chapter six. And let's go to verse 14. So the elders of the Jews built and they prospered through the prophesying of Haggai, the prophet and Zechariah, the son of Edo. And they built and finished it according to the commandment of the God of Israel and, a Comor, uh, and according to the command of Cyrus, Darius, and Artaxerxes, king of Persia. Now the temple was finished on the third day of the month of Adar, which was in the sixth year of the reign of King Darius. Then the children of Israel, the priest, and the Levites and the rest of the descendants of the, of the captivity celebrated the dedication of this house of God with joy. So you have about 40 to 50,000 Jews that left Babylon and came back to the land of Israel. And they began working there in Jerusalem. Everything was destroyed. The temple was destroyed. And so they rebuilt the city. They rebuilt the wall around the city. They finally had finished even the, the rebuilding of the most important thing, the temple itself. And it's all done. My friends, you can achieve 
the unachievable. And when you lean into it with all of your heart, God will send the resources. God will send the provision. God will send the skilled laborers, whatever you need. And you probably don't need, you know, the equipment to rebuild the stone temple, but you do need various things to move forward with what God has called you to do. But you are going to accomplish it through faith. Faith achieves what in the natural would appear to be unachievable. Praise God. Lift your hands right now and say, with God's help, I can do it. Let the spirit of faith touch you. And while we don't have Zechariah and Haggai to stand up, and I, I can't invite them in to come behind this pulpit and prophesy to you like they did to them. But I tell you today that God will help you to do it. And if you need a prophecy, God will be sure to bring it into your life through one way or another. If you need encouragement, God will bring it. All of heaven is backing you. And by the way, if you need a little laughter and a little joy, because some of you do, you've gotten a little bit weary along the way. God knows how to bring that too. And if there's anybody that knows how to make you laugh and catch you off guard with some of the most unusual statements that make you laugh that you've ever heard in your life, it is none other than the Holy Spirit. Oh, Pastor Stephen, with God, we have to be serious with everything with God. Yes, there is the reverence of God. There is the respect that we have for God. But there is nobody like the Holy Spirit who can say some things to you out of the blue sometimes that are so, uh, sometimes they're like puns. They, they make a statement that encourages you at the same time. It, it, he's doing it in a way where it has a double meaning. And sometimes the double meaning is so funny. Honestly, it's even silly. Sometimes what the Holy Spirit can say, and all you can do is laugh and say, God, there's nobody else like you. Remember the Holy Spirit is not a force. He's not a cloud. He's not a dove. He's not a fire. He's not wind. He's a person. Now he can come in as a person in these forms that would seem like, like the, like he's coming in as a wind, but no, he's not wind. He is a person. He's the third. He is the third person of the Godhead. Praise God, father, son, Holy spirit. But I'm telling you today that uh, even if we can't get Zechariah over to you or hey guy, uh, the Holy Spirit himself is with you and he can give you a word regardless of where you're at that will so make you laugh that the next thing you know, you're right back engaged in perhaps what we could call your temple building project. Praise God. And thus you are achieving as well the unachievable mm -mm. because look, uh, it took them a little longer, but when it was all said and done, there it is finished off. And that's the temple. That is the temple foundation. And uh, even some of the walls that were there when Christ walked into it. Oh yes. Herod jazzed it up and Herod, uh, you know, built a big retaining wall and made the uh, whole area more level and then built out and made it more grandiose, but he still kept that primary uh, temple there of Zerubbabel that was built and just, you know, like I said, just jashed it up a whole lot more and made it bigger with some other rooms and everything. But uh, that was the temple that Jesus walked into. And that's why you had a lot of the young people rejoicing. A lot of the old people were weeping because they said, oh, the, you know, the temple of Solomon, we, we remember it when we were young, it was so much more glorious but they're forgetting that God told them to build this temple. And they didn't understand that the prophecy that the for, that the latter glory is going to be even greater than the former glory. Uh, they're, they're not understanding. This is the, the temple that the Christ will come into. So they could, they couldn't uh, wrap their mind around that. That's why some uh, of them were weeping. Well, if they knew that the Messiah was going to walk into it, you know, they wouldn't have been weeping. But my friends, we have to take these words by faith and believe God. He has, our best interest always at heart. So we see these principles that we can use to implement into our lives to do things that the world would say can't be done. But my friends, let's, let's ask ourselves the question, how does faith get these impossible things done? Well, 
I think the easiest way to look at these examples and to then make the application of it in our lives is to understand that we accomplish these great things by drawing on the power of God. So let me take you over for a moment to the New Testament. I want to give you an example in the Gospel of Mark. Mark is my favorite gospel out of the four gospels. And let's go to Mark chapter 5 and look at a, a story down in verse 25 about the woman with the issue of blood. Verse 25. Now a certain, a certain woman had a flow of blood for 12 years. Now, I've taught on this before. I want to come in from a different angle. I want to highlight a different truth or different revelation today. But you would understand, though, that in Jewish culture, uh, she's unclean according to Mosaic law. So in a situation like that, uh, you can't work because work requires you to socially interact with people. So you can't do that. So that's going to affect your finances. And you're, you're also, you can't, you can't go up for the feast days. You just, you're cut off and you're, you're in many ways like an outcast because of this physical problem. And this is very mentally challenging for a person when you're in a place like that, because it's very easy to get into a place of depression and despondency. Now a certain woman had a flow of blood for 12 years and had suffered many things from many physicians. Well, you can only imagine the humiliation and embarrassment of all these, you know, male doctors trying to examine her. She's not getting any better. They can't fix the problem anyhow, but just all of the humiliation of having to deal with that. She had spent all that she had and was no better, but, but rather grew worse when she heard about Jesus now, we know that faith comes by hearing, but it's not just hearing, hey, he's a nice guy. No, it's hearing about the miracles. It's hearing about the power of God that's riding on his life in ministry. And you, when you start hearing that, you start thinking, well, hold on a minute. If others are getting their miracle, I, I, can, get, I can get touched by that power as well. And I get my miracle. And when you're real desperate, and now you're all out of all kinds of options. There are all the options are gone. You've exhausted every source, but now you have a sure hope. Well, with many, I mean, I'm telling you, your faith just explodes on the inside. This is a real challenge for the Western church. We have to admit it because we have all kinds of options today. So many that in many ways you can cruise through life as a, an American Christian and almost not have to use your faith on anything. Just get a good paying job, eat healthy, exercise, and, you know, just trust God, serve the Lord. And it's not like you really have to use your faith. Uh, you're, you've already used your faith to go to heaven, and you're, you're just kind of maintaining that. But, oh, I tell you what, something comes in from the, from the devil. If he, if he gets a breakthrough or brings something in, suddenly... You can find yourself realizing, uh oh, I'm out of shape spiritually. I haven't been exercising my faith. Now this thing's got to jump on me and I don't know how to deal with it. And may see, even in the natural realm, remember Steve Jobs, one of the richest men in the world, you know, the guy that put Apple and uh, made Apple world famous, yet he has all this money, has all this fame and success, and he gets sick. He gets hit with one thing, and the greatest doctors in the world have no cure, have no solution for him. And the next thing you know, he's dead. So there are things that, that uh, can break in on your normal, smooth, enjoyable life. And we want life to be smooth and enjoyable. But, you know, Jesus said in Luke chapter 18, uh, in the parable of the unjust judge, he said, when the Son of Man uh, comes, will he find faith in the earth? In other words, when you've got all these medicines and wonder drugs and you have food all, all over the place, and not only food, you have, you have food channels and you have options and options of the most delicious food, um, you know, you're going to have to, you're going to have to realize all these things are there and that's nice, but you can't get into your destiny zone on nice, the violent, the violent 
take it by that. When I say violent, I'm not talking about swinging a crowbar. I'm talking about faith. The violent take it by force. That's violent faith. You can't get into your destiny in cruise mode. You cannot get into the levels that God wants you to step into just by cruising and everything's convenient and nice. And that is one of the greatest challenges of the modern church, not just in the Western world, but even in many other places as nations all over the world, any, yeah, even many nations that uh, used to be called or, or in some ways mil- may still be identified as being undeveloped. Look, they've all got cell phones and, uh, uh, you know, uh, a lot of things are coming online around the world, whether it's internet or clean water or whatever it might be. So it's a challenge for many people. And I think also when Jesus speaking to the seven churches in the book of Revelation, when he got to the Laodicean church, he, he did rebuke them. And he said, I rebuke everybody I love. I bring correction to anyone that I love. But he was telling a special promise also to the Laodicean church that if you overcome like I did, then you'll sit on my throne. He said, I overcame. And I sat on my father's throne because I qualified because I'm, I was an overcomer. And if you overcome, then you'll be allowed to sit on my throne. So the thing is, is that you can only overcome by knowing the faith walk, maintaining it because the promises are so rich, particularly for the Laodicean church, because it's one thing to be in great persecution, to be in poverty and have the system totally broken down. And now you're having to trust God. Okay. That's good. And that's very commendable and honorable, but it's another thing to trust God and really walk close with him. When so many things are in reach where a lot of people say, why do I even need God? Ah, the day will come. They'll find out they do, but the enemy can work through all of these things that put, that put people to sleep. That's, that's the whole thing. Jesus dealing with the church in Laodicea, basically wake up your sleep and your eyes that you think can see so good. You're spiritually blind. So don't let this culture lull you to sleep because it all can go up and smoke in a moment. And I don't want it to. I want stability. I like a stable government. Um, nobody wants lawlessness in the streets. But just because things are going good doesn't mean that we go on faith vacation. And that's something that is a real challenge when you're in the middle of all these wonderful things that are everywhere with options for recreation and fun and all of this fun stuff everywhere. So to climb above that and still say, God, this is all good, but Lord, I I, I can't settle for this. I've got to use my faith to get into what you've promised me. That's very, very commendable in the age and in the hour in which we live. Praise God. So if you can overcome in, in the middle of Not just difficult times, but if you can overcome in the middle of prosperity, which is when cycle uh, from the from the area of cycles, Israel always fell away from God during times of prosperity, during times when they're being beat up by enemy nations or being subjugated into cruel treatment by neighboring, you know, uh, ruffians, they would eventually cry out to God, Oh, Oh God, give us deliverer. We repent. (laughs) And God would deliver them. And the moment the judge or the deliverer died, they go right back into sin again. Why? Because now everything's going good. So if you could rise above all of the comfort and all of the good and really walk with God and believe him in those types of times, yes, that's extremely commendable. And those will be the ones who overcome, particularly in that scenario who are allowed to sit with him on his throne. In other words, there's that, that implies ruling and reigning with him in the times ahead. Woo. Praise God. Now, when she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment for, she said, if only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. Now let's pay careful attention here. Immediately the fountain of her blood was dried up. She felt in her body that she was healed of the, of the affliction and Jesus immediately knowing in himself that power had gone out of him, turned around to the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? 
But his disciples said to him, you see the multitude thronging you and you say, who touched me? See, they, they, they still don't get it. Now, later, they're going to understand about the anointing, the power flow of God, how that works and so forth. But it says, and he looked around to see her who had done this thing. And then, of course, uh, she reveals herself and the, and the truth is told. Now, when Jesus said, who touched my clothes, he's basically saying, somebody pulled the power out of me. Now, that's the power of the Spirit riding on him with that mighty anointing. But he, he's basically saying, somebody just pulled power out of me. That, my friends, is what faith does. These insights that I have been sharing with you, that's what they're all doing in, in, in different ways. But these insights that are allowing you to make these quantum leaps, it takes place because you are somehow touching God connecting with God in a way that does what it releases that power and you can't, you can't get there without that power. So that's what we're looking at. We're looking at the power release. And so when Jesus is saying who touched me, he's basically saying somebody just pulled power out of me. Mm -mm. Now the, the disciples are like, well, we didn't see anything. It, yes. It's, it's spiritual. This is spiritual. You can't see it in the natural. The only way you can see it is if the Holy Spirit opens your eyes to see it. I've seen it happen in the Spirit. And when I've seen power flow like that, it looks like, like uh, to me, it looks like white glory, uh, like a waves of glory whoom, that come out. Wow. And you can't, you, in the natural, you, it, you just, all you see is the result. But in the Spirit, you could actually see it flowing. Oh, it's beautiful. Praise God. So when you pull, from God, you pull from a failure proof source. Oh, hallelujah. That's why you can bank on God. And that's why this works when you really make that connection. Mm -mm. Again, when you pull from God, you are pulling from a source that is failure proof. Thank you, Lord. Now, as we know, it was not the woman's touch. It was her touch of faith because all kinds of people are bumping into Jesus. And I'm sure there's a lot of curiosity seekers just reach over, touch him on the shoulder, see if something happens and nothing's happening while they're not touching with faith. So we see from this story that faith is not just believing God. It's actually connecting to God. Yes, you believe, but that belief must make that connection. And you've got to stay in it until it does. And it will. Trust me. It will. Praise God. Faith connects you to power, or what the King James Version called virtue. But faith connects you to that power, which then puts you in a place of control. Such as her, she's no longer uh, bound by this demonic work. She's now free from that thing. So no longer are you being suppressed, oppressed, in some cases, even uh, possessed by the devil. Now, when, I'm a, when I say possessed, a Christian, of course, cannot be possessed because their spirit belongs to God. But uh, if, you're, if you let the devil in, uh, you could have a lot of trouble with your flesh, even with your mind. Praise God. So faith connects us to power, which puts us, not the devil, not the disease, not the sickness. It puts us in control. That's why you want to use your faith and connect with the Lord. Keep pulling on him by faith for the release of that power. So by the Holy spirit, I see you pulling something out of that power realm of God. That's going to take you to a significantly higher level. Trust me, you and I both believe God's got the power. I don't think there's any Christian uh, who believes, uh, who, excuse me, who would deny that. Even non Pentecostal Christians that don't even really believe in miracles or anything like that, they would still admit, admit that, yeah, God, God's got the power. If he did do something, he certainly could. But what I'm proclaiming from the gospel and from the scriptures is that you can connect with that power. Just like Abraham did, just like David did, 
just like uh, Ezra and Nehemiah and, uh, you know, these great prophets, Zechariah and Haggai and Elisha and Elijah, they're, they're, they're a people of faith, but they are making that connection like the woman here did with the touch. My friends, keep reaching, keep pulling, and you're going to see, receive a power jolt that will, uh, see, I'm talking about real testimonies. Pastor Stephen, they gave me a nickel raise at work. Uh, that, that's nice. Uh, we don't need to stand up and testify about that. That's just natural. Anybody, if you just keep working, eventually you're going to get a raise. Okay. But I'm not talking about, you know, 15 cent raise or something like that. I'm talking about jumping. I'm talking about quantum. I'm talking about, I'm talking about raw power of God touching your life. That's more than a 25 cent an hour raise. I'm talking about something that alters glory to God alters your life. I'm talking about a power altering experience that doesn't just move you forward a little bit that blasts you into a new realm that God actually wants you to be walking in. Lift your hands. Father, I pray for your people that are watching, that are listening right now. Let there be a power release in their lives. Let them pull upon the hem of the Lord's garment. Let the virtue flow. Let the power flow. Let them stand in faith, just like Abraham did. Let them stand in faith, just like the saints of old did until they got that temple finished. Let them stand, Father God, as the power is released so that they can get done what you have called them to to do. I thank you, Father, even as this woman received her healing, and suddenly she's free from all the embarrassment, shame, humiliation, financial lack, and the utter destruction that the enemy afflicted upon her life. I thank you, Father, that your people are going free so that they can be mighty witnesses for you and testimonies, walking, living testimonies of your power. Oh, Father, we thank you for full deliverance and full salvation in Jesus great name. We all say amen. Praise God. For those of you that are watching this message, listening to this message, and you have not made Christ your Lord and savior. He is the only source of power. Now there are other, there are other forms of power out there. The devil can even promise to give certain types of power. Uh, we would call it occult power and so forth, but it's, it, it's given at the price of one's soul, but you can be free and you can break covenant with the devil and you can receive Christ as your Lord and savior. And he's a good God and he'll take you to heaven with him. If you would like to get your life right with God right now, don't wait another moment. Don't wait another day. Pray this prayer from your heart right now. Say, Jesus, I'm a sinner, but you died for me on the cross at Calvary to pay the price for my sins. Jesus, come into my heart. Save me now. Wash me clean with your precious blood. Write my name in your book of life. And Jesus step into my life and lead me and guide me from this day forward. In your name I pray. Amen. And amen. Welcome to the family of God. Those of you that just prayed that prayer. Now, as believers in Christ Jesus, let's take holy communion together. I want you to grab some unleavened bread and some grape juice. I use these little portable communion cups and just grab what you can grab some grape juice, grab some unleavened bread. If you don't have that, find something that will suffice until you can get your own grape juice and little wafer. Praise God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the bread and the juice. We bless it through this prayer. We set it apart as holy. We thank you that it is now the body, the flesh and the blood of Jesus. And Father, as we receive the Lord's body, we thank you, O oh God, that we can achieve the unachievable. We can conquer the unconquerable. Father, we can do these things through faith as we make that power connection. Father, I pray for your people today that as we receive the Lord's flesh, that they be strengthened to press on 
because you're going to do a miracle for them. Father, even as Gideon said to the angelic messenger, where are our, where are all the miracles that we've heard about? Where are the miracles? I thank you, Father God, that miracles aren't a mystery. But Father, it's a matter of connecting with the power source. And that, that's only done through faith. So Father, we thank you for the raw, genuine miracles you're doing, that you're going to do, and great will be the testimonies. Father, in Jesus' name, we now receive the flesh of Christ. Let's partake together. Praise God. The Lord is moving in power right now all over the world. Don't have a, a you know, Gideon changed his mentality, but don't have a mentality like he did originally. Hey, uh, where's all the miracles at? As if God's not moving. God is moving, but we must line up according to his scriptural requirements. Walk with him. And my friends, we're about to see some phenomenal things happen I know, I know I'm going to soon be receiving some mighty testimonies from many of you because you are touching and pulling on the hem of the Lord. And there is going to be that release of power. Praise God. Praise God. People will wonder what happened to you. And you'll simply say, well, I touched the Lord. And then the others will say, well, I, I touched him too. They have to understand it's that touch that makes the contact, the touch of faith. Father, thank you for the blood of Jesus as we receive his cleansing blood. We thank you, Father, for forgiveness of sins. And Father, we forgive our enemies. We forgive anyone who has harmed us, anybody that maybe has spoken bad things or anything. We forgive them, we bless them, and we go on with you. We thank you, Father God, for the blood of Jesus cleansing us. And we thank you for the blood of Christ protecting us. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's receive together. Praise God. Praise God. Right now, God has on his mind a miracle for you. Don't you dare quit or give up. You're so close. The power is just about to flow. Make sure you're praising God day and night. Thanks for watching. I look forward to seeing you back next time. Bye-bye.